Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, which is available to you as an audiobook, a paperback, and the ebook is free. Yes, free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Don't worry about me, about plenty. Uh, I'm happy to give you a free book and knowing you're going to come back with money to buy Banneker Bones and the Alligator People and Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy. We're going to have a lot of fun together. Uh, for thousands of interviews with editors, literary agents, authors, book people, the world's best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. I uh, couldn't be more thrilled. Tonight I am talking... Uh, with Hildy Lyshak, uh, author of the brand new Hildy on the Record, a memoir of a kid reporter. Uh, and as I talk to you, Hildy, you who have just written your memoir are 15. Is that right? That's right. So I'm assuming that this is the first of many memoirs yet to come. I guess we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I never, uh, I, my pledge to esteemed audience and to my guest is I never make a guest sit through me summarizing their biography or their book, but in this case, uh, they are one and the same. Uh, so I've got all kinds of questions, but uh, maybe we should start with, uh, give esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background. Yeah, so hi, I'm Hildy, and I've been publishing a newspaper since I was seven, and Hildy on the record, I wrote, and it was just about my life and some of the lessons I learned being a reporter so young and growing up with this um, weird passion I had. So the, you tell me which of this is apocryphal and which of this is true. Uh, from, from what I've read and seen, and of course I watched part of the brand new Apple show, uh, which is Home Before Dark, uh, which is uh, lovely. Uh, and I'm assuming 100% accurate accounting of, of precisely what, what happened. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you you started a newspaper at age seven, and that's with the help of your father, who had also been a journalist. Is that right? Um, yeah. Well, when I first started it, I didn't have any help from my dad. I started it, and actually, I have a cue card. I started it, and I wrote it out in crayon and like things this big. Um, but I got help with my dad for the layout and all that. When I first started, it was just very unprofessional, very messy, <laughs> um, until I got help with the layout and the printing. And you were at one point going around door to door to distribute the paper, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, when I first, so when I first got help from my dad, um, I got a bunch of these copies printed out. And so I went to every door on my street to knock, cause I had no subscribers then to knock on every door and just like hand people a free copy um, I had lots of doors slam in my face. Sorry, I had lots of doors slam in my face. Um, a lot of people were very confused. I had this one lady yell at me, and she saying she was already subscribed to uh, the other local paper. <laughs> but things only went up from there. <laughs> well, at that point, was the other local paper were they out of business or going out of business? Oh no, they were still they were still up and running. It was just. Um, my newspaper focused in, I mean, maybe not when I first started, but it focused in on my town and their newspaper was like three or four towns. So it didn't get as much of a focus um, like into the town that I did. Um, also, I think they were a little bit affiliated with the town a lot more than I was. I got you. So what's your first memory of, of wanting to be a reporter? What, uh, what, what, what? What propelled you on this journey to become a reporter? Um, so my dad was a journalist. Like you mentioned, he reported in New York City and he would take me along with him on a lot of the stories, but he quit his job when we moved to Pennsylvania. And I realized that I actually really missed reporting and going with him on these stories. So I figured there was nothing stopping me from starting my own newspaper because obviously no big newspaper would hire me. So I could just start my own. So I would still be able to do what I loved. He was taking you to um, crime scenes at what, like age four, because you didn't have a babysitter? Yeah, <laughs> um, unintentionally. It would usually, because he was gone a lot, and he wouldn't really be able to see me unless he took me on some of these stories. So it would be a situation where he would take me, and he would be thinking he was going to report a super just like chill story, like a parade or something. But, you know, the news turns so fast, and a lot of times he wouldn't have time to take me home beforehand so I'd end up like on a crime scene but it didn't it didn't happen too much 
well, some people might say, oh, that's no place for a child. And yet here you are now you've written a memoir only on the record. So it obviously worked out. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And then, of course, uh, things really get going, what, two years in uh, is uh, when you're doing a, when you tell the story, what, what happens two years in? Um, so I was walking. I was actually, I was covering a story of a chocolate stroll in my town, which was basically this thing in my town where um, every business gives out free chocolates. It's not really a great story, but me and my friend really like chocolates. So we were going to go and we were reporting on that story. She was helping me with photographs, but I got a... I think it was a call from one of my sources and they told me that somebody, there's a homicide a few blocks down from my house. So I didn't know if the, cause the source wasn't completely um, like trustworthy. Like I hadn't gotten a lot of, but I knew it was worth checking out. So I went bike down there and it was, was accurate there'd been a homicide there was a man who hit his wife over the head with a hammer but he had a stroke a few a few days earlier I believe so and it alters your behavior but I was the first on the crime scene and I was the first to get out the story because the local newspaper with all the adults weren't there and you already had your um, network set up through Facebook and YouTube and where else oh yeah I think I had I had um, Facebook YouTube Twitter and then um, I had my website. I didn't really handle a lot of the social media stuff. My older sister Izzy did a lot of that because I'm like really bad at social media. Has that changed? Or are you still mostly hands off with social media? Um, I have my Instagram where I control completely, but the other stuff, I just it's very confusing to me. <laughs> I don't I don't get a lot of social media. You're better off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so too. I think I'm not missing much. So, uh, in, in prior to this, because that's April of uh, what 20, um, 2016 that 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 happens. I might and then 2016. Yeah, that you get a GoFundMe going. So you've already bought up good good favor in the town because you had a, 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 a there's a. You had a GoFundMe to help hire a police officer to respond to some of the local vandalism. Do I have that right? Oh, yeah, you're right. I Wow, I, that was a while ago. I forgot about that. Yeah, um, because the vandalism like problem in my town was getting increasingly bad. And they, it wasn't that important to the bigger newspaper because they were, uh, you know, covering so many towns. But to the people in the town, of course, it was super important because it's a small town and the vandalism was getting increasingly bad. So that right away, you've already got uh, goodwill stored up to you. So you <laughs> yeah, I, I got some sources. Out. So oh, we should trust Hildy. She helped us uh, <laughs> get, the, get the cap on the beat for the vandalism. Yeah. And I'm assuming the vandalism did go down, right? It's, it's, a, it's a thing of the past. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure because I don't live in that town anymore, but I go back and I only hear good things. I don't, I think, I think it went down a lot. Um, I, <laughs> the plant vandal, which was a big story that I covered, and it was basically this guy, uh, he, like, there's, I don't know how to, there's kind of this town square type situation, and there are these really nice plants, but there was this man who got really angry, and he, like, knocked them down, and I actually got him, I reported so many stories about it, I got him to do an interview with me as long as I took his name out on some of my previous stories. So he did an interview with me. Um, and he basically, what happened was he just, he was, he had a lot to drink and, you know, he was at the local restaurant. He got into a, I think he got into a fight with his girlfriend or something and he came out and he whacked the plants. <laughs> but the vandalism did go down a lot. <laughs> I understand you can be upset if we were a fight, but the plants didn't do anything. Come on, fella. <laughs> so I'm curious, at nine years old, you've got sources who know to call you when something goes down. How do you go about cultivating sources at age nine? So the vandalism stories I reported on were a huge help because I already had goodwill in the town because nobody else was reporting these things. Another thing I also did was I printed out business cards. And before I had business cards, I just give people my number. But I would go to every business in my town. And I was like, if you ever have a story idea or anything's going on in town, please call me. And that, you know, 
it takes a bit to build that up. I went in every week consistently for a few months before I started actually getting calls. Um, I let me think where else, what else did I do? Oh, um, like people walking, I would just go up to them and I would ask them if they had any story ideas. I would give people my business cards, that type of thing. And people come to know you and they say, oh, it's Hildy. We want to tell her what's going on and not, uh, oh, Hildy's coming, run. I don't want to be in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of both. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds fair. Uh, and then, so you had this, this huge story brings, um, what, national attention, right? I mean, it's it's right. almost the equivalent of going viral, I would think. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't um, realize a lot of that stuff was going on at the time. Because, again, I'm not really on social media. Um, it was just my sister running it at that point. And I kind of knew there was some commotion because I think my parents were arguing about it. Um, because the, the attention I received at first was, like, really negative. But I, I, didn't, I didn't really understand the scale of it all until people were wanting to interview me, which was very confusing for me because I was the person interviewing other people. Why would people want to interview me? So I didn't fully understand it at first. So you've become you've become the story rather than the chaser of the story. <laughs> yeah, which you know, a court like seven year old or what nine year old me knew that was like the number one real rule of journalism is don't become the story. And I became the story. I was like, this cannot be good. But um, <laughs> everything ended up working out. And then of course, there's a bit of a backlash. I know you know everybody's brave online when they're writing their comments, um, and they don't they don't have to look you look you in the eye, but they have thoughts and opinions about whether or not a nine-year-old should be investigating uh, a murder. Uh, and you you have a, a statement that the esteemed audience could go and view that you made. Um, what did you say to those people? So I got, like you said, I got a lot of backlash immediately, you know, people telling me I should be having tea parties and playing with dolls and a little girl should not be in those situations. But I made, um, I made a YouTube video responding to a lot of people's comments and basically saying that I wasn't going to back down no matter what people said about me. And I think the main reason I really did it at the time was because I have two little sisters and I did not want them to see me being pushed around by a bunch of like adults online. So it was really important for me to set a good example for them. Gotcha. Uh, and then so... Um, when do you begin to make the rounds? Because you start, uh, at some point, you, you start talking with Christine Amapur, and by the end, you've got blurbs on your book from, from her, from uh, Keith Olbermann, from Hillary Clinton, if anybody's heard of her. <laughs> lots, of, <laughs> lots of big time folks have, have noticed what you're up to. When does this start to become the case? I'm not sure. For me, I know it was a, like a buildup, but for me, it really just happened all at once because like you said, I'm not on social media. I wasn't really looking at this stuff. Like I did the interviews because, you know, it was fun for me to you know go back to New York with my mom and do these interviews. That was always fun because I got to see all my friends from New York and everything. Um, but it wasn't, I don't know. I don't think I fully soak it in at the time. It's a thing like a month later, I'll look back. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that happened. Um, but at the time, you know, I stay off social media. I try to stay pretty level about things. And so um, other than the paper, what what uh, what hobbies have are you doing at, at nine years old? At nine, I was, I mean, I was playing with Barbies. I was having tea parties. I had, I have, a, I had a lot of stuffed, I still, you can see them back there. I have, I had a lot of stuffed animals. I would have tea parties with all my stuffed animals. They're all very elaborate. I was doing all of the normal kid things. I was doing what everybody was criticizing me for not doing. I was still doing all of it. I was just <laughs> doing other things too. <laughs> So to all of those haters online, you will have tea parties, but you will also investigate crimes and whatever else you feel like doing. Yeah, I got criticized a lot by people telling me I should be playing with Barbies, but I played so much Barbies until I was too old to play Barbies. But I was just, I was just doing more than that. <laughs> is there an age that's too old for Barbie? What was that? I said, is there an age you think that's too old for Barbie? I'm hoping not, because if there was, it would definitely be 
below the age where I stopped playing Barbies. <laughs> I've got my Batman action figures up here behind me and a whole bunch more over in the corner. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that I'm still playing with them. <laughs> but now I have a son, so we, we play with them together. <laughs> um, so, okay, so at what point um, does this, all of this transition into becoming an author? Because you and your dad, you wrote a series with Scholastic, right? Hildy Cracks the Case. Right. Um, that have, I think I wrote those when I was 10. And I got, I got approached by Scholastic, if I remember correctly. And I mean, I really wanted to do it because I love fiction writing and I thought that would be so fun. And I thought it would give me more of kind of a platform to inspire more like kids and young girls that they can do beyond what they're told they can do. So I was super ecstatic about that. And it was a really fun experience. So with uh, with so they come to you and, and I can hear all of all of my usual listeners banging their heads against the wall who've been sending out queries and hoping that someone in publishing will take notice. But Scholastic comes to you and why wouldn't they? You're you're a tremendous superstar at this point, uh, and and they come and they 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 say well, how how does that work? Do they come and they say would you like to write just some fiction or do they have something specific in mind? You know I could be wrong I. I'm pretty sure they approached me, but I think before they approached me, I had like the proposal um, that my dad had helped me with that I sent out to like the rounds, but I don't think, wait, I sent out, so I had the, I had the proposal and I sent that out and then I think Scholastic approached me, but they weren't like one of the publishers that I'd sent them out to first. And I went kind of, because I think the books were going to go into a different direction. So I kind of rewrote a lot of it for the Scholastic series, if I remember correctly. I was pretty little. So I, my parents, you know, handle a lot of that stuff. Gotcha. <laughs> you all work together and you come up with uh, with your stories, but in, in book form that uh, an editor at Scholastic can sign off on and agree should be out there in the world. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> Uh, so now here you are, you, you've conquered all forms of media, you've got books, you've got your YouTube, you've got your paper, um, and um, what, uh, at what point do you with, get with Christine Amapur to become awarded that 2019 Singer Award for Press Freedom? Mm -hmm. How does that come about? I think, I think they emailed me about that, and because I remember, I'm pretty sure I gave a speech at that event too. So in what 2019 Tucson I think yeah I think they emailed me about that I've had I don't know for me at the time it's never something like I really soak in at the time I was just like oh like it's just another one of these things it'll be fun it's cool I get to meet these people but that's really all it is for me just like a cool experience to meet those people and then like a year later I'll look back on it and I'll be like oh my god like why why wasn't I more freaking out about that then? But I kind of had my freak out delayed, if that makes sense. Delayed, delayed. Well, if you're going to freak out, honestly, that's the most useful way, I think, to have it. Yeah. <laughs> Years later, after you can't possibly, it can't get in your way. It's already done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, was there any part of it that was terrible, making the speech in front of people? Was that nerve wracking? Or were you, nope, this is nothing. I'm on YouTube all the time. There's no problem. It was speeches for me. I've been doing public speaking since I was pretty little. Um, so for me, speeches have, I mean, even before the paper, I was really into acting and I did a lot of theater things. I mean, I still am, but so I had like, I don't know, I, I was kind of used to speaking in front of an audience. So speaking for me is never really, like it wasn't something I would freak out about. Um, I think I get myself into a state of mind where I'm like, this is just like, this is like not even a big deal. It's no problem. And then afterwards I have my freak out, um, which like you said, is very useful. So I'm not like getting in the way of anything. Cause I think if I truly soaked in what I was doing, I would probably do a lot worse on the speeches and everything because I'd be kind of freaking out. <laughs> I'm a little bit jealous. It's almost like a superpower. <laughs> Just put that on hold. I don't need you bad thoughts and energy. I'll, I'll, I'll do that you later. <laughs> So, um, okay, so that happens, and then you become, uh, 2019 also, you become the youngest person in U.S. history to deliver a commencement speech, which esteemed audience can, can view online as well. That's at uh, West Virginia University's uh, Reed School of Media. 
Mm -hmm. so how did that, uh, how did you become to be invited to, to give that commencement speech? Oh, well, uh, she, um, Dean Reed, she emailed me. She actually, um, she found me on, what's it, Yellow Pages. Like she Googled me and stuff. So she emailed me about this and I was just so ecstatic. That was something where my freak out strategy did not come in handy because I was freaking out before that. I was like so nervous. I was so, because I knew how, like, it was such a big deal for me at the time. And I didn't want to mess up in front of all these people because they only got one commencement speech and I wasn't going to be the one to, to, you know, ruin that for them. Like this is a moment for so many other people and it has nothing like to do with me basically. So that was something I was super nervous about, but I did it. And I, I think I, I'm pretty happy with how I did. And I'm so happy I got that op opportunity. It's probably like the favorite speech I've ever done. Well, if a student audience goes and watches it, it's right there on your Twitter feed. They absolutely should go and check it out. Um, mm -hmm. A close-up uh, of you, how many people are in that crowd that you're addressing? Oh, I have no idea, and I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Um, I just gave, actually, I just gave a keynote speech a few days ago um, in LA at the National High School Journalism Convention, and uh, I like made the mistake of going into the room. I was giving the speech in the night before and I saw all the chairs like laid out and I freaked myself out a lot. Cause I'm like, Oh my God, those are going to be people. So I try to, I try to like, not, I try to think they're like Sims or something. Like they're not real people. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're the star of a video game and it's just a bunch of uh, computers. Yeah. Staring at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some AIs. That's a good strategy. <laughs> uh, who's to say it's not true? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Reality is a simulation, then there's no there's no need to be nervous <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a downside to, to thinking that way. It just hasn't occurred to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm assuming that you you pulled back. I know that you uh, put your paper on hold in 2020 over the, the pandemic. What led to that decision to put that on hold after so many years? Um, I wish I could take credit for that situation, but I really can't. My parents made the decision. Um, they wanted me to focus on school more. I'd been doing, I mean, I'd been doing the newspaper for what, like five years at least. It was, um, it was a lot for me. And I think my parents wanted me to realize that I have more, like more options and more things I can do outside of journalism. And I mean, I might return to journalism one day, but I'm ultimately very happy for that decision because I've been able to explore a lot of the other things I like. I'm back in school now, which is nice because I was homeschooled for a while. So now I'm focusing on school and all the, all the normal teenager things. <laughs> And so now you're, now that hopefully knock on every piece of wood there is, we're heading, if not out of the pandemic, into some new safer phase where we can be out and about in the world. So you're giving speeches again. Did you miss it? Are you happy to be back to it? I missed it so much. I'm so happy. I love speaking. It has to be one of my favorite things. I really, I mean, I didn't even realize how much I missed it until I gave this speech recently. And I remember when I finished it, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to do this again. I cannot wait that long again to do it. When you're uh, in, in, in the speech that esteemed audience can watch down, you go through and you uh, lay out very clearly a case for why um, American media has, you know, in generalized terms, um, lost the trust of the American people. Why do you think that is? I think a lot of the news outlets and a lot of reporters are just um, getting, like, they share their opinions a lot. And I think, you know, the America is pretty divided. So no matter what like opinion you give, there's going to be a certain, there's going to be um, a lot of people who aren't going to trust you now because of that opinion. I also think a lot of journalists are kind of struggling to stay objective and to have like a really um, obje objective point of view, which I mean, I get it's difficult, but I think that is something that's so essential to journalism. Gotcha. And so if they would just be more objective and less uh, less partisan one way or another, then maybe we could trust them a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for editorials and like, you know, speaking your opinions and your thoughts. I am with that 100%. I just think it should be separate than a news story that you're reporting that you're putting out there. 
Gotcha. What are your political opinions? No, that was a I... test. You know. <laughs> 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 but if you're if you're willing to share, by all means, go right ahead. <laughs> No, as a reporter, I mean, if I ever choose to go back to it, I'd like to, I'd like to reserve that just in case I want to go back to reporting. I also like to think that it should be a thing that we could be reserved to be changed by uh, over time. Yeah. Uh, your opinions aren't changing. Yeah, every- that's another thing. I'm very young and I am uh, very firm in my beliefs, but whatever I say now, I can get more educated and I can learn more and I can completely change my mind. But the thing I said at 15 will always be immortalized online. So (laughs) it's probably not best for me to share it. Well, that is a problem, but you don't do much of social media. So a tweet coming back to bite you is not as much of a concern as this whole volume of (laughs) memoir that you have put out into the world. So what does the esteemed audience need to know before they go and they they purchase their copy of Hildy on the record? Uh, I mean, I like to think you don't really need a lot of context, too, because I kind of explain a lot of it. And I explain my newspaper in my early years before I did the newspaper. But I think Um, I think it's a valuable thing to read because I learned a lot of lessons because I was in like the limelight so young and I learned a lot about how the way we perceive ourselves can be changed by other people's perceptions of us if we aren't very firm in ourselves and who we are. Gotcha. And so is that, that's what you'd want uh, a reader to take away or who was the ideal reader uh, for this story and what would you want them to take away? I don't have an ideal reader. I think anybody who would read it uh, could get a little something out of it. At least that's what I like to think. And I just, I would want a reader to take, I would want a reader to take away the idea that they could, they really could do great things. And if they just set their mind to something, as, as cliche as it is, they could do amazing things regardless of what other people in their life are telling them. What do you think it is that keeps people from setting their mind to things and achieving their goals so often? Um, I think I think that's kind of personal to everyone. I mean, self doubt's a big one. I think people. I mean, I'm not I'm not ex- like excluded from this. People are really you know insecure about their ideas and about what people might think of them or what people already think of them or things they're being told by their parents or peers or teachers or whoever. Well, the uh, bad news is that that continues indefinitely. There, there will always be uncertainty. I, I'm, I'm not convinced of this. There isn't an age you can reach where, oh, and now I understand everything. I have achieved total wisdom. No finish line. No, no reason to worry. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm, I haven't achieved all the ages yet. So if that, if that changes, I'll let you know. Maybe it's next year. Who knows? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe your next birthday, you'll just have it all figured out. <laughs> I will wake up and I'll, oh, I, I get it now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a good day. <laughs> so um, as far as uh, Hilda on the Record goes, what, uh, what, what motivated you to, because uh, um, you're, I mean, the book's coming out now, so I'm assuming you're, what, 13, 14 when you decided to write your memoir? Yeah, I think, I think I was um, 14. And the main reason I decided to write it was because since I was little, I've had a lot of people telling me who I am through these stories and betraying this picture of me that just wasn't really accurate to who I was. So I just wanted to kind of set the narrative straight on my life. So this is it. This is the definitive account. Now you can move on and and start playing memoir from age uh, 15 to 20 or whenever the next one you think is Who gonna knows? Be. <laughs> um, and I, in the acknowledgments, you mentioned that your mom, Bridget, woke up every morning at 4 a.m. to help. So what's the process that she's getting up so early to help you? What's the process in writing down your memoir? Um, so usually when I, when everything I write, I have my mom look at. A lot of people, uh, people know my dad's a writer, but a lot of people don't know this, but my mom's actually an amazing writer. But she's definitely a harsher critic than my dad is, which is why I always go to her with things I've written for advice, even if it's a little bit unwelcomed at the time. <laughs> it's always very, it's always very helpful in the grand scheme of things. So I have her look at everything I write. 
So what's how does that work? That uh, she's going to give you harsh advice, and then afterward, <laughs> she's still got to be mom, right? You can't just storm out <laughs> and not talk to her for the rest of the day. Yeah. How are you able to separate that that uh, that 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 business aspect of your relationship, where she's giving you the advice you need on your writing, from your mother daughter relationship? Um, I honestly don't. <laughs> It's like, um, I mean, I wish I could be better at this, but she'll give me advice sometime and I'll just be so mad at her, even if her advice is completely right. I'm like, no, everything I do is perfect. And then I like get mad at her for the rest of the day. But I'm very grateful for her um, because obviously my writing this book would definitely not be as put together or coherent or something prop readable without her. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> So when you sit down to, to write this, uh, this, I mean, this is the story you're born to write. You know this one. <laughs> um, what, do uh, you have to go back and do research on things that happened to you to remember who you were, what you felt? Um, yeah, I mean, I talked to my mom, my dad a lot, and my mimi a lot about this because I don't, I mean, some of like the earlier years were kind of blurry to me. And there are certain things that happened that I wanted to kind of keep um like objectivism about so I'd want to get multiple points of view from how it happened so I would talk to people in my life about it oh, I thought well, as soon as I, I saw this I thought well how brilliant because if I went to write a, a memoir of myself at uh, seven or nine it's gonna be a pack of lies because I filled that in with a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of what I tell myself now I don't I, I could look at photos I could give you my best guess but that was a whole nother person where, you know, you're writing about yourself at seven, you're literally twice that age and then some uh, at this point. But you're, you've got closer perspective than if you waited until you were, I don't know, 25, 30, one, one moment more than, than where you're at currently. So um, what is that process? How do you decide what to include, what not to include, and how to present everything? Um, so I would write, I mean, I've started by kind of like free writing, so I'd write a lot of stuff that I wanted to be in a chapter, almost like journaling. Like I'd write it out really messy, like bad grammar and stuff. And then I would look over it a few more times. And every time I kind of edit it a little more. Um, and I mean, before this, I'd also like talk to people if I, didn't, if I was kind of blurry about an event. If I didn't really know what was um, like if I wasn't sure how it went, I would talk to people. But, you know, I'd, I'd go over and I'd kind of edit it more every time. And then I'd have my mom look at it and I'd edit it more and I'd have my mom look at it. And it was kind of a back and forth process. Gotcha. So you and she are going back and forth. And then do you get other readers involved? Or when do you, when is it ready to share with someone else? Um, it was just between me and my mom because my mom helped me so much. It was between me and my mom until we had the first draft or maybe second draft. And then I showed my dad it, but I was, I was like really careful because I did not want, I mean, I didn't want to, I wanted to get advice and stuff, but I didn't want the story I had in my head to be really obstructed and I didn't want to get in my head about things. So I didn't show my dad um, till after. My sister still, she actually, she's reading it now because I just gave her a copy <laughs> of like the physical book. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much the only people who read it was like my agent, editor, my dad and my mom before it was published. And how long does it take you to get that first draft when you're just going back and forth with you and your mom? Um, like a few months. I don't remember exactly. It was kind of slow. I mean, I'm in like school and everything and she's a teacher, a full-time teacher. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a long process, but I think like a few months. It wasn't, it wasn't too long. So when you're writing, are you writing every day? Do you write at the same time? I try to write every day. Like, in general, I try to write every day, even if it's just journaling or something, but I'll try to get at least like 200 words a day. That was my goal when I was writing the book, which of course doesn't always happen. You know, I have school and I have like different obligations, but I, that's my goal, like 200 words a day, which is really not a lot like for me. I disagree, depending on what you're writing. It can be the most, uh, most, uh, most worked out, highest work out ever. <laughs> I've had days where I uh, weep with joy if I got to 75 words. Like, whoo, that was so difficult. I mean, quality over quantity. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> sounds like they're all bad. But my God, I got them on the page. <laughs> <laughs> That's an accomplishment. 
<laughs> some days <laughs> showing up and getting something done is uh, <laughs> good enough. <laughs> but of course, that that's made up for by days where the, where the words just won't stop flowing out of you. And I'm assuming yeah. you had that experience as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are you? I'm assuming you're still writing your journaling. What are you? What are you working on now? Um, right now, I'm not working on any writing projects. I mean, I journal a lot and I draw a lot, but that's really um, like writing wise. I'm not working on any projects. Um, I've been exploring a lot of my interests outside of journalism. I really like math. I think I might want to be a biochemical engineer, but I also really like filmmaking. So I think I might I think I might want to be a filmmaker. So I have very, um, very conflicting passions that I'm going to have to get all figured out. Well, I, I don't know. Can you do, I, I know filmmaker, you could do that uh, just like you did your paper to start, right? You could make movies for YouTube if you wanted. Yeah, I mean, I like filmmaking. I think that's something I could like start even now. Cause I, I mean, I have a phone, I have a camera, like I could, but it's just, I don't know. I need to think some things over about that. I gotcha. You're talking to a guy back when I had filmmaker dreams that I was running around with a big old VHS <laughs> camera. And then I oh, had awesome. uh, two VCRs hooked up and that was my editing back and forth. So uh, that, that's my old man way of saying, you kids don't know how good you got it with your phones and your <laughs> <laughs> digital editing platforms. I mean, it's true, it's true. But is bio, uh, you said biochemical engineer? Yes. Is that something you could do from home? Is there a way to do that? Or you gotta get a I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I mean, maybe if you're like an absolute genius, but not for me, probably. Uh, I thought that's I was something. To <laughs> an absolute genius. <laughs> far from it. Far from it. <laughs> um, no, it's something I'd like need a degree for and everything. I think. Um, but I really like math and stuff, so I think I might want to do that. But I'm trying to keep my options open. I'm trying not to commit to one thing completely. Life is short. Why wouldn't you want to do a little bit of everything, yeah? Exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of fun stuff out there yet to do. Yeah. So with this book, I, I hesitate to ask this question because I worry that it might get in the way of your, uh, or it might be impacted by your superpower of, of delayed freak out. But there is a lot of, um, I was surprised by how much um, personal detail you included in, in your memoir. Um, you know, things like uh, you had some issues with food, there's some bedwetting, you talk about the death of your grandmother, or your grandparents, a lot of personal stuff. Does it, um, do you have any fear at all? Or is it, it going to hit after we talk, have this conversation right before you go to bed tonight? But do, do you have any concern at all about putting yourself out there that way? Oh, for sure. It's, it's really intimidating. Um, when I was writing this, like, I had to kind of pretend I was journaling through half of it. Like, I had to keep in mind that no one would see this, even though people would see this. But it's it's a very scary thing to do. Not even my my delayed freakouts could um, help with that. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's terrifying. But for me, it's like writing is like my art form, you know? Um, it's how I can express myself. So, like, a lot of the things I wrote in this book, I would never tell somebody face to face. But since I'm writing it, it's kind of easier for me because it's writing. It's what I love to do. I hope that was coherent. I'm not sure if that made a lot of sense. Yeah, when you're writing, it's just you and you. And mm-hmm. then you're not there when whoever is going to read it, reads it, and has their reaction. That's that's their experience separate from you, right? Yeah, I, I try to think of it that way. And well, another question then. Um, as it's your memoir, um, you can choose to include whatever you want. Why was it important to you include those personal details and to preserve all of them? Um, it would probably be easier for me to like paint this picture on this like super genius kid who doesn't have any struggles and can just like go through the world so easily. But I didn't really want to, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I didn't want to, well, first of all, I think to tell my story, it's kind of like essential to um, talk about some of the things I went through. I also didn't want to set this, I feel like we can look at other people through social media or like online or anything or like celebrities and we can think, oh, like they don't have anything going on. If I was them, I would not have any issues. And I'm obviously not at that level or anything, but I didn't want to set false expectations for what a teenager should be going through 
And I didn't want somebody else who was my age to read that and be like, oh my gosh, like I'm, con- I, d- I didn't want somebody who's my age um, to read something where it was me being like, you know, like these are the best years of my life. I'm doing so great. I'm like doing all these things and like feel awful about themselves. I didn't want that to happen. So it was very important for me to be honest. Good for you and good for your readers. <laughs> although, you. although you are doing pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. um and then uh, we got to talk about we got to talk about being on apple plus so how does uh, this is crazy to me to have people on television playing you and your family so how does it come that that home before dark comes about oh um i don't even i wasn't even super involved like with like because there's my agent right and i think i think so my agent wanted to sell was like selling the rights for my story basically. And I didn't really, I, I mean, like my parents tell me these things, but I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to like go on a walk. Like I'm going to ride my bike, you know, like I kind of tuned out a lot of it. And then I remember, um, I was on the phone. I got to be on the phone with Joy Gorman, who's the producer and my parents. And I, that day I had a theater performance and I did not, like, I wasn't super, aware of the situation or what was like going on at first I was just really concerned that I was going to be like late to this dress rehearsal because it was tech week um just like you know like the week leading up to the performance where it's like really intense rehearsals anyway but I was like that was the concern going on in my head this like community theater thing so I was on the call and that was when I was like first kind of like soaking in um that that was like happening and I didn't really realize what um, a big deal it would be at the time. You know, I, again, I was very concerned with get, getting to my performance on time. Like that was my main, that was my main priority. Um, and then uh, with the show, the writers would meet with me, um, like in the writing process, and they would meet with me and my dad, and I think my mom sometimes, and they would just like talk to me and my dad about our life and everything. And it, it was a lot of fun. It was really cool they flew us out when we were filming, when they were filming to Vancouver and we got to see like them, them filming everything. And I think that, I think that really inspired my love of filmmaking, but it was so cool to see all the behind the scenes stuff. And they were building, like (laughs) they built an entire house basically for like my, like for um, like my, my alter ego's house. I don't know how to describe it, you know, like fake me on the screen. Her, she had this entire fake house and you got to walk in it and it was so cool so you're walking around like this isn't my house at all you guys see <laughs> <laughs> so uh okay so that can, where, when does it when does it go from it's talking i'm talking to some writers to oh this is definitely going to be a show people are going to see this and they're going to think this fake me is me to be completely honest i didn't even i didn't like get it really until or maybe I was just like delaying it (laughs) but I didn't get it until we went on the set and I saw like they also built this school they built this entire school for fake me and my fake friends and my fake sister (laughs) which was so weird to me and it was absolutely strange it was such a strange experience and it doesn't get any less weird it didn't get less weird with season two it's weird um also for me specifically my name isn't a very common one I never hear people say my name in general so to watch a show where people are like saying my name it's very strange it's a very off-putting experience (laughs) but a great one well in all fairness was it Hildy Lysako like how do they say it Lisco it was Hildy Lisco (laughs) It's just a, a totally different person, <laughs> which which it kind of is, right? Because I know the the first episode doesn't even the first episode that, that I enjoyed didn't even really match up with your story one for one. There's enough of the original DNA there, but as they go on, I know there's talk of a season three. Has that been officially announced yet? No, um, I'm 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 not exactly sure what I can say, but season three is not uh, not happening. I'm you know if there's a chance, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure I can say this, but if it isn't, then I'll I'll email you. But I think I can say this. Season three, not happening. Um, but I think 
like, you know, the plot wasn't super uh, obviously realistic to my life, but I think one thing they really nailed was my personality and kind of my family dynamics. My mom was so spot on to how my mom is in real life. Even the actress who played my mom, Abby, so much like my mom, it's crazy. Uh, my dad wasn't like super, um, they made him like, kind of like deep and interesting. And I mean, my dad's interesting, but he's not like, I don't know, super sad all the time. Like my dad is in the show. <laughs> um, but they really nailed the family dynamics. Uh, they, re they really nailed my sister, Izzy. Oh my gosh, she's exactly like that in real life. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Do people now come up to your dad on the street and just hug him like, it's gonna be okay. You're gonna be all right. <laughs> <It'll> be okay. <laughs> My dad in the show knew how to play guitar. My dad doesn't know how to play guitar, which I'm very upset about. I wish my real life dad knew how to play guitar. <laughs> You're watching fake you listening to fake dad play guitar. Like, That's how good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a swap out with fake me. That's uh... <laughs> and I know you interviewed what's the actress's name who plays you, Bridget? Somebody? Um, Brooklyn Prince. Brooklyn. Yeah, I know you interviewed her, but did she did she meet with you? Did you guys talk about who you are as a character? How'd that go? Yeah, we're actually super close right now. She's like my she's like a little sister to me. I love her so much. She's like so talented, and I mean, everyone knows she's an amazing actress, but she's also like such a good writer. She's like a superhero. But um, yeah, so we met. Back, back to your original question, um, I remember the first time we met. I think it was at the Plaza in New York, if I remember correctly. It was at some hotel. And she was just, like, so sweet. She ran up to me, and, like, we hugged. And it was, like, this dramatic movie moment. Um, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, we hung out a lot. She, like, in 20... I mean, maybe this was 2020. She came to Arizona, and we went to Tombstone together. And we went on this ghost tour um, <laughs> together, which was, like, so fun. Um, but hopefully we can meet up again soon. Well, hopefully, I'm, I'm sure Brooklyn is listening to us. I'm like, yes, talk more about how I'm a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> she really is, though. It's crazy. She is an amazing actress. I really enjoyed uh, her, her performance. Um, uh, having just now met you for the first time, it's spot on. It's <laughs> obviously. Um, but with that happening, I, I, I'm just curious, and I don't know if there is a, a way to answer this question, but I wonder how does that change you, having a fake a fake family on television that the whole world uh, is watching? I'm assuming people you know in real life and are interacting with at school and elsewhere have watched the show and have questions for you about, hey, did this happen? How much of this is like you? Um, so, okay, with this, I'll answer the school question first. So I went to a school, right now I go to high school in Nogales, which is like 20 minute, 20 minute drive from my house. And I love it there. It's super great. Lots of people there. Um, the school I went to at the time when the show came out, there were 11 people in my grade. So I was not going to, of course, I'm not, I mean, I, it's awkward. It's like the whole, my whole situation, it's awkward to bring up because you bring it up and it's like, it sounds like the most pretentious fake thing ever like I just it's it's awkward for me to bring up I don't like bringing any of that stuff up um however somebody who I knew before who was in my class um like told everyone like my whole situation <laughs> and I'm just like I mean look I, I actually don't care now like, look, looking back it's not like a big deal to me or anything but I was mortified at the time I was so upset I was, because I just didn't, I don't know, it's an awkward, of course, in a class where it's just 11 people in my entire grade, and I was in seventh grade at the time, which is, like, when people are the, you know, like, I don't know if you've met a seventh grader, but they're the worst people to ever exist. <laughs> <laughs> Middle school girls, no joke. Um, and I remember when the trailer came out, like, everybody was watching it in my class, and I just, like, stood there awkwardly I it's it's a it's kind of it's just such like an awkward situation I think I like asked to go to the bathroom I was like walked around like the campus <laughs> oh my that I mean you might have be like maybe one of three people in all of history that maybe have had that experience right I don't know how I don't know what the number is but it can't be that high yeah um I still don't like I mean I have my close friends at my school who know this stuff but I don't, like, people don't, like, 
unless like I, I'm like close with somebody, people don't know anything about my newspaper or anything that happened to me. At least I, I just like how I try to keep it, you know? So if they don't know, you don't tell them. Yeah. You don't have a shirt that has your Hillary Clinton blurb on it. <laughs> <laughs> Should? I don't. I should, just wear it at home. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just look in the mirror and feel really good about myself. <laughs> Hillary Clinton never says anything about me other than, like, I wish that Rob Kent fellow would stop talking so much. I'm getting it on a shirt and I'm wearing it every episode. <laughs> you should have a shirt that's like, Hillary Clinton has never interacted with me. It's like, wear it around and then people will get, like, really suspicious about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, getting back to, if you go back to being a journal, you can't have political uh, bias, I suppose. So you couldn't wear a Hillary Clinton shirt, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you wrote uh, a book about a UFO, one of the few guests uh, I know that's written a book with UFO in the title. And I ask everybody who comes on this show, uh, Hildy Lysak, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? Um, okay, yeah, both, I think. Or maybe I'm just being dramatic. Okay, the UFO thing, I'm probably being dramatic. But the other day, not the other day, like a few, a few months ago, <laughs> not the other day, um, my dad, so I leave really early for school in the morning. I leave at like 540. So it was still completely dark out. My dad was driving me and we saw this like giant light in the sky. Not giant. It was like a star. <laughs> well, we saw this light in the sky and it like, it like poof, into the ground. Right. So we thought it was a meteor or something. Um, but like nothing, we heard nothing about it or anything. Um, that's like the only UFO experience. I mean, I've seen like weird things. But no, nothing too, like, intense, you know? Ghost, however, um, I, my house right now that I'm in, I'm convinced I is, like, super haunted. I really think it is. Um, let me think. Um, let me think of some things that have happened to me recently in this house. Oh, like, a few weeks ago, my parents were in Tucson, which is, like, two hours away for their anniversary for the weekend. And my little sisters were at my grandma's house. So I was home alone. <laughs> and I kept hearing okay so for context this is my bedroom right there's a door right here and then there's a bathroom and then there's another door and then there's my little sister's room then there's also a door behind my mirror that goes to the outside so I was laying down in my bed reading my book and it's not even like you know in movies everything happens at like midnight or something or 3 a.m it was like 4 p.m it was like midday you know it was like like nothing scary could happen, right? I kept hearing somebody knocking on my door, like my bedroom door right here. And like, it wasn't a scary knock. It was just like a, like that type of knock. And then I would go and I would open the door and nobody would be there. And it would go on like a few times every hour. And then it, like at first I almost thought it was funny. I like thought, I don't know, it had to be caused by wind or something, even though it wasn't windy. Um, but when it got dark, I FaceTimed, I remember I FaceTimed my older sister who just moved out at the time she just moved out and she was in Tucson. And I'm like, Izzy, like, I can't be in this house anymore. I was so freaked out. Um, and then I, my grandma picked me up and I stayed at her house because I was really scared. Um, you think, oh, um, my dad, when we were moving in, so the living room kind of has like all glass there's a lot of like windows, right? And when we were moving boxes in, my dad saw like this statue of this woman, which was like life-sized, right? And since we were moving in, he wasn't super familiar with the house. So he thought it was just a statue, right? Then he goes in my living room and there was nothing there. And he was like three feet outside the door and he could see it through the window. Um, let me think of other things. Have you, do you have any ghost stories? <laughs> Uh, yes, but I'm here every week and esteemed audience has heard me say that I can't, the version, the ghost story that I have is not middle grade appropriate. I haven't found a way to make it appropriate. <laughs> so every time I've told it, I've cut it out. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, let me think. Oh, my old house was haunted too. Um, it was like, I, when I lived in Seals Grove, I lived in this old um, bed and breakfast. So it had like, it had um, two staircases. It had like a, it was, it was just a creepy house, you know? Some houses you just go to and they're so terrifying. It had a really just like creepy vibe to it. And um, my sister, 
that's probably what it anyway my sister had like a bunch of awful nightmares in this house which isn't paranormal but she's like not that type of person you know um and then she my sister izzy she saw like a woman who's like going down the stairs in like um like like 1950s clothing and stuff and it wasn't my mom because she was a blonde and she was like 20 but she could only see she could only see the woman through the reflection of the window but there was no one there and it wasn't like she was super far away she was like in the living room and there was a this i'm just being so confusing right now for like a writer <laughs> but there's a staircase going down a couch and then like windows right so my sister's on the couch and she sees in the reflection of the window the woman going down the stairs but like she can check like that and there's no one there um let me think oh speaking of my sister izzy she like and i know this isn't completely paranormal but my sister uh she would have like constant and she doesn't really get this she'd have sleep paralysis which is you know like when you like wake up but you can't move but she'd see this man who was like standing in her room in this house like the house i'm in now <gasps> how did i not mention this i'm sorry you asked me like a simple question i'm just going on a rant <laughs> no this is wonderful please continue uh, i was this is like so recent. This is not going to sound scary at all, but it was terrifying. So I was laying down in my bed, like doing my reading. I was up later than I should have been for a school night. It had to be like midnight and it was a windy night. So at first I thought I heard like, I don't know, like wind whistles, you know what I mean? But then I realized it like didn't sound like that. It sounded like a flute. And at first I didn't really think anything of it. I thought that it was just, um, you know the wind or something and i was just kind of making things in my head but then i realized it was a song and i can't remember the song now but it was a song i knew and it was kind of like an older song but like it had like the chorus and the verses and stuff but it was being played on the flute um super weird and i was just like i didn't i wish i looked out the window but i did it uh i mean i hope it was a ghost because, like, if it wasn't a ghost, the alternative would be, like, a man standing outside of my window playing the flute, which is, like, slightly creepier than a ghost. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's it for me. <laughs> Maybe he's a very nice man, just the, the neighborhood flutesman. <laughs> neighborhood flute man. He stands outside people's windows at midnight and he plays his nice little songs. I wonder if the police would see that after they were called they'd be the, the, the same way. Oh, what a nice public <laughs> service you're performing. We're sorry. We we were going to arrest you. But we didn't realize you were the flute man. Please continue. <laughs> oh, yeah. You're just a man standing outside of a teenage girl's window. Keep going. Completely normal. <laughs> nothing, nothing out of order here. <laughs> I, I <say. laughs> well, this, and, and I should say Izzy, um, if you're listening, I'm so sorry to hear that that's happening to you. That sounds terrifying. Um, paralysis, ever since I, I, since I was a boy and first heard that uh, regarding alien abductions, I thought, well, that must be the most scary thing that could ever happen to you. Aliens, no aliens, just lying there, not being able to move. Um, even if that was, that was the extent of it, for five minutes, 10 minutes, forget it. <laughs> that, yeah, that's never happened to me, but it sounds so terrifying, even without like the ghosts and stuff. like. Even if it was just like normal, like, ugh, sounds scary. So I think we've, we've maybe unlocked a new passion here. Is it possible that maybe we'll we'll see Hildy does uh, paranormal investigations at some point? Oh, I would love to. That'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it sounds like that's a real possibility. Well, Hildy, I, I, I'm watching. Our time has has has, has gone away, uh, as as it always does when you're having a wonderful conversation with an interesting person. Thank you so much for for making time for for esteemed audience. No problem. My uh, last question for you for tonight, and then we'll do this again on down the road when your next memoir comes out. Uh, but for tonight, uh, I wanted to ask if you could go back to yourself. Uh, at seven, at nine, at whatever age, it would be helpful to go back and give yourself some advice that might have made things easier for you and might make easier the path for all those who are listening to us who would like to be a reporter, who would like to go out and, and, and get started. What would you go back and tell yourself? Um, I'd probably go back and tell eight-year-old me that it's like, it's okay to have, you know, emotional attachments to these stories and it's okay to not, it's like, it's, it's fine that you're not completely like 
stone cold about these stories and it's okay to feel like sympathy and like have uh, like some emotional attachment to these stories. And I would tell myself that's really normal because that was something I tried to, I tried to like tuck away for a while, but it's just really not how I am. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Where can an esteemed audience find you online or, or keep up with your happenings? Um, okay, social media wise, the one I'm active on is Instagram, and that's just my name, um, Hildy Leeshak, H I L D E L Y S I A K, um, on Instagram. That's I'm really active. If anyone like has any questions or anything or wants to DM me, I will completely answer on there. Like I'm very active on that. Hi, as always, esteemed audience, for interviews with all the world's best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees that will change your life. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.